Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tim Poe. I'm Director of Telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network. And I'd like to welcome you all on the 26th of March, 2018, to this North Carolina Community College Lecture, Oncology Lecture. Uh, just a few quick preliminaries and we'll get started. Uh, if you're having any the excuse me, technical difficulties at all, please call 919-445-1000. We have staff standing by who can help you out with any technical problems that you may be experiencing. We're on Mediasite and we're also on GoToWebinar. So if you're experiencing any trouble with one of those, we do have the other as a backup. All right, uh, you can find us on Facebook, you can find us on Twitter, uh, YouTube, and then we're on the web at unccn.org, and that's probably the best place to start. If you are using Mediasite, just a quick reminder that uh, up in the upper right-hand corner when you're looking at Mediasite, you've got these four little icons, and those give you different views. You may want to uh, view picture in picture, or picture beside picture, or just the slides, or just the video. You can do any of those, and if you want to switch which is bigger, which is smaller, you can use these two little arrows for that. So that's a, an easy way to get all the control you want if you are a Mediasite user. All right, we will be using poll everywhere, and we encourage all of you to answer a poll at the beginning today, and then also to ask as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Uh, the easiest way to join poll everywhere is to take out any phone capable of texting, and in the to field, you're going to type the number 22333, and in the message field, UNCCN. So 22333 in the to field for the number, UNCCN in the message field. You'll get a quick response back saying joined. That's all you need to do for this afternoon's presentation. After that, if it's a letter question, multiple choice, you can put in A, B, C, or D and send that along. And then you can text in your full text questions as well at the end of the presentation. For today's presentation, the question is, for our starter, leukemias, lymphomas, and myeloma are all forms of cancer which affect which types of cells? And if you think that's A, you would put in, if you think that's breast, you would put in A, lung B, kidney C, or blood D. And we'll show that poll again in just a moment. But if you want to go ahead and uh, give us your best answer, this is all anonymous, uh, we'll take a look at that shortly. We want to welcome today our presenter, and our presenter is Dr. Thomas Shea, MD. Dr. Thomas Shea is a professor in the School of Medicine at UNC Chapel Hill. He is also the director of the UNC Bone Marrow Transplantation Program, associate director of outreach programs for the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center, and associate chief and fellowship direct program director with the Division of Hematology and Oncology. In the past, Dr. Shea has served on the Executive Committee of the North American and International Bone Marrow Transplant Registry and is President-Elect of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Center for International Bone Marrow Transplant Research, the world's largest repository of data on transplant outcomes. Dr. Shea serves on the editorial board of the Biology of Blood and Marrow Transplant and as a reviewer for numerous journals, including Blood, Journal, of clinical oncology, bone marrow transplant, clinical cancer research, and cancer chemotherapy and pharmacology. All right, Dr. Shea, welcome. We're so glad to have you here with us today. Thanks, Tim. So that, that's uh, quite, a, quite a list of credentials. Uh, for, for our audience with the community college students here today, maybe you can give them a little background on your trajectory uh, and, and what influenced you to become a hematologist. Sure. Um, well, thanks, Tim. I, I think that, um, as you'll see from today, part of what makes hematology fun is the use of microscopes. It's a big part of what we do, and when I was in training, I just really enjoyed sitting down at the micros microscope and spending some time, um, you know, looking at the slides and looking at the way these different uh, problems tend to appear under the microscope uh, as a reflection of the biology that's going on in the patient. So, uh, I'd say as much as anything, I enjoyed, uh, or the reason I went into the field was uh, largely because of the laboratory correlates with it as well as the fact that when people develop cancers, um, whether they're blood cancers or uh, any kind of tumor, the oncologist tends to become uh, their primary care doctor, even though what I do is pretty specialized, 
uh, when you get sick with these problems, your oncologist tends to be the person that you go to for most of your issues. So um, I think it kind of combined both the laboratory piece as well as the uh, clinical care piece that may be pretty interested in the field. So Great. Well, thank you so much. How did they, how did they do on our poll? <laughs> well, I congratulate the audience. It's either we've carefully selected the audience or uh, they should at least understand what they're getting in for. So, great, great. 100% of people said that there were blood cancers, so that's a good thing. Good. So, well, we tried to make that pretty straightforward. Uh, and again, part of that is so that you are now set to go ahead and submit questions at the end of the presentation. Please be thinking about your questions, jotting those down, and then having those ready. And again, we'll get to as many as we can uh, right after Dr. Shea's presentation. So uh, without further ado, caring for patients with leukemias, lymphomas, and myeloma, what are the diseases, what problems do these patients have, and how can you help? Great. Okay. Thanks, Tim. All right. So let's go ahead and get into this. And I think that, um, you know, today's talk is, is really based on all the different uh, kinds of cancers that come out of the uh, bone marrow or the blood system. Um, it's not exhaustive, and so I've limited it to kind of the three major categories, and of course within each category there's many, many different kinds of cancers. But the first slide that I wanted to show you is what we call the hematopoietic tree, and um, without belaboring it too much, um, if you see over here on the left-hand side, this is kind of the um, primitive stem cell, which is which you're born with at birth and which is capable as shown by this little circle here, of replicating itself. And so the same cell that you're born with as a infant, you know, offspring of that kind of uh, stem cell can live for the rest of your life. And then over time, these cells begin to enter into what we call the replication system and then begin to make their offspring cells once they differentiate. And so they start as these stem cells and then they go into this population here where they can either become myeloid cells or lymphoid cells. And then as I'll show you, um, uh, as those cells mature, they either become immune type cells like lymphocytes over here, or they become the cells that come out of the myeloid compartment, which are the platelets that help to clot your blood, the red blood cells that carry oxygen to all the organs in your, in your body. And then the neutrophils, or the uh, main part of the white cell system that are capable of, infighting inf of fighting infections such as strep infections or staph infections. Um, and all of these kind of come from the same uh, primitive stem cell to begin with over here on the left. And so just to show you a little bit about what I was referring to earlier regarding the um, slides that we look at, when we get a blood smear on somebody, that's over here on the left-hand side, and all of these little red cells are literally that. Those are the red cells that populate the blood uh, stream, uh, carry oxygen, um, you know, through uh, their combination with hemoglobin, and then the red cells deposit the oxygen uh, as it gets released from the hemoglobin in the tissues, and that's basically the source of uh, energy, if you will, for uh, most of your organs. Um, in the middle here, uh, this is what we call a bone marrow aspirate. So you actually take a sample of the marrow itself, and the marrow is inside the bones, and that's where the blood cells are made. So that's kind of the um, factory, if you will, for the uh, cells that then show up in the peripheral bloodstream out here. Um, and then over on the right-hand side, uh, in addition to pulling a piece of the marrow out and looking at it under the microscope, you can actually get a little bit of a core that's about the size around of a lead pencil, uh, or the, pen uh, the lead in a pencil, rather, and it's usually about half an inch or so long, and that kind of gives you a picture not so much of what the individual cells look like, but rather what the architecture within the marrow looks like. Um, these little circles here are fat globules, and those are normal, and you should expect to see them in a normal marrow, whether it's a biopsy or whether it's the aspirin itself. As people get older, more of their marrow is replaced with fat, so the cellularity in the marrow, i.e., uh, this part of the marrow becomes progressively less over uh, years, and so in a 20-year-old it would look different than a 70 or 80-year-old, uh, where in the younger patient it would be more of these kinds of cells, in the older patient you'd see more of these kind of fat globules, and that's a pretty normal part of aging, uh, but that gives us uh, an idea of what we call the overall cellularity in the marrow itself. <clears throat> 
Now, um, one of the things that I particularly like about hematology, and I've talked about looking at it under the microscope, but this is an aspirate of a marrow that is what we would call a healthy appearance. And by healthy, I mean one of the things that you're looking for when you look at the bone marrow under the microscope is lots of different kinds of cells. And so this big cell here is actually a cell that uh, gives the rise to platelets. And so platelets are the part of your uh, blood system that clot the blood and form the uh, kind of skeleton on which blood clots form. And so you need them, obviously, if you have any kind of tissue injury to help clot the blood and to uh, then heal up your wounded area. Uh, these other cells, I won't go into a lot of detail, but you can see at the, at the point of my uh, arrow here, this kind of a cell and this kind of a cell, those would be cells that we would call our neutrophils, and those are basically infection-fighting cells. Those are the kinds of cells that I mentioned uh, tend to be available for uh, treating staph or strep infections and things like that. Some of the other cells in here, like this one here at the tip of the arrow, this would be a lymphocyte, and lymphocytes are different kinds of infection-fighting cells. And then you can look at other cells like this one here, which would be an immature red cell. And so the point is that there's lots of different stuff going on, and that's normal. That's what you want to see in somebody who's got a healthy bone marrow. Now we're going to talk a little bit about three different major categories, and the first one I'm going to talk about is the leukemias. And the first, uh, the, the, the overview of the leukemias is as follows. Basically, they are cancers that arise from the metapoietic cells in the bone marrow. They start in the bone marrow, and then they show up in the peripheral bloodstream. And these are cancer cells that are predominantly of either myeloid origin, and I'll show you what that looks, or lymphoid origin. And if you go back to that first slide where I showed you the first couple of lines coming out of that stem cell on the left, were actually the lymphocytic or lymphoid organ um, uh, differentiated cells. The rest of them came out of the uh, myeloid component of the marrow. Um, if you look here, what we talk about is that these kinds of abnormalities become either chronic leukemias or they can become an acute leukemia. I'll show you examples of both as we move forward a little bit. And finally, the difference between a chronic and an acute leukemia is acute leukemias are the kinds of problems that tend to result in people showing up usually quite sick, and it, and it happens fairly quickly, so that somebody may show up with an infection or may show up with some bleeding or they may show up with some problem that is related to the fact that over a period of usually a couple of months, they would have developed an acute process. Chronic leukemias people can live with for years and years and years, and oftentimes are just picked up on a uh, normal physical exam or an annual examination where the blood smear is abnormal, and then you start to figure out uh, why is it abnormal. But frequently, people are relatively asymptomatic uh, with these kinds of chronic leukemias. So the first one I'm going to talk about is what we call chronic lymphocytic leukemia, or CLL, and it's actually the commonest of the adult leukemias. There's about 15,000 new cases in 2008. That's probably up to about 17 or 18,000 a year now. Um, and there's about 4,400 deaths every year from CLL. So you can already get some sense that most people will live for several years with CLL. In fact, the average lifespan is in the range of 10 to 15 years. Uh, with this disease. So people live with it for a long time. It's hard to cure, but it's fairly easy to treat. Um, the average age is in older people. They're 72. And there are rare familial forms of it, but for the most part, these tend to be out of the blue sort of idiosyncratic problems that uh, definitely present in older populations of patients, uh, but not really have a very strong um, uh, family history. This is what a normal red cell looks like here. Um, and this is what a normal lymphocyte looks like here. And in somebody with CLL, you see many, many more of these cells than you normally would expect. But the point is that they're about the same size as your red blood cell, a little bit bigger, but not a whole lot bigger. And this is what the morphology of a normal blood smear looks like. And this is what the morphology of somebody with CLL looks like. And so if you look in the smear, you can see there are just way too many of these pretty cells here that are floating around. Um, and people can have white counts under normal circumstances that would range between 5 and 10,000. And out of that 5 to 10,000 that you count in the laboratory, maybe two to 3,000 would be lymphocytes. Sometimes people can develop uh, blood counts of three or 400,000 uh, when they have CLL, so the numbers can be 
much, much higher in 95% of the cells in the bloodstream would be these kinds of CLL cells like we're seeing here. And you can see here in this case, they're almost as numerous as are the red cells. And so uh, way too overrepresented compared to what the normal circumstance is here. And again, this is kind of where the lymphocytes about the same size as a normal red blood cell. And this is the white blood cell that would be fighting infections or what we call a neutrophil. And there tend to be more of those in other circumstances, but not so much in the CLL population. Remember I showed you a marrow picture before that showed a lot of diversity amongst the different kinds of cells that you see in the bone marrow? Well, this is an example of uh, what we call monotony. And basically all of the cells kind of look the same way and that's not a good thing. Your marrow should be a pretty picture with lots of different kinds of cells in there. When you see too much of one kind, that's usually a signal that there's a problem. And that would be what the marrow would look like. I hate to interrupt you, but I think our microphone for our GoToWebinar participants just got bumped and, and got knocked out of, of, the, uh, of, of, of its connection. So I'm going to bear with us for just one moment. I just want to reconnect that and make sure that uh, everything is working properly. And let me check. Uh, I'm getting a message back that says uh, you're fixing it. And uh, let me just double check with him. And I'm asking him if it's working now that we've reconnected that mic. We'll wait and see if he gets that to us or not. Bear with us again for just one moment with this. Uh, hopefully we'll have that back. And, and John, if you're standing by, if you could just let us know if you are again receiving the audio on GoToWebinar, please. And we're waiting for that message to come in with bated breath. We can hear you. All right, we're good to go. Okay. <laughs> Watch those feet. <laughs> okay. All right, sorry if I uh, tripped on something. <laughs> anyway, um, all right, well, thanks for uh, rejoining. Um, so this is just, as I was saying, I don't know if you heard me, but uh, this slide is, depicts a bone marrow that is kind of monotonous, um, you know, collection of just the same kind of cells. And you can see here, as opposed to what I showed you early on, there's really no diversity. All of these cells look the same. And when you see that in a bone marrow, that's usually a bad sign. And so we'll get to some other examples of that. But diversity in general is good, and monotony in general is bad uh, when you're looking at uh, blood smears or bone marrow smears. Now, how do people present with CLL? Um, well, it's a mixture of things, but as I mentioned, oftentimes people will end up getting uh, situations where they feel pretty well. Sometimes they'll have a lymph node that may pop up or they feel a swelling in their neck or perhaps under their arm, but oftentimes it's something that could be picked up just when they're going in for a routine physical exam on an annual basis, or they may go into the emergency room for some other problem, and it could be that uh, this is made incidentally. Uh, common symptoms, though, when people are finally diagnosed or generalized, and those are they can lose weight. If they end up with a big spleen, which is sort of a lymph node in their belly, uh, that can actually compress on the stomach, and people can end up uh, not eating well because of uh, what we call early satiety or their stomach fills up. On physical exam, you see lymph nodes that are swollen. As I mentioned, the spleen could be big, sometimes the liver. And then in your uh, blood smear, you'll see a high white blood cell count, like I talked about before. There are a number of common therapies, all of which are quite effective, but none of which are unfortunately curative for this disease. Um, but most patients can live for 10 to 15 years uh, as long as they're on some effective therapy. Even if it doesn't get rid of it, uh, it can control the disease for a prolonged period of time. Now, the other form of chronic leukemia I'm going to talk about is CML, or chronic myeloid leukemia. It's a disease that's a little bit less common. Uh, you see about a third as many new cases a year, about 4,800 to 5,000 or so a year. Um, and the number of deaths used to be much, much higher. Uh, in the old days, uh, before the current therapy was available, uh, people would tend to have a chronic phase of CML that would last for about four to five years and then it would turn into an acute leukemia that was particularly difficult to treat. Currently, with some of the therapies that I'll show you a little bit about in a minute, uh, people are able to control this disease and probably be cured as long as they stay on their medicine, uh, such that the um, likelihood of this disease being fatal now is only about oh, probably 20% or so of the people that are diagnosed with it. So uh, we've made some huge strides over the last 10 to 15 years with some of the drugs that are currently available uh, for uh, this treatment, uh, for this disease rather. 
the average age is about 65, so again, tends to be in older patients, a little bit more common in men than in women, and risk factors are the same as those that can cause any kind of myeloid uh, leukemia, acute leukemia, or chronic leukemia, ionizing radiation, certainly people that were exposed to the atomic bomb or bomb blasts like that, uh, either in World War II or during the testing uh, prior to that, there was definitely a higher risk of uh, both CML and acute leukemia uh, that we'll see a little bit more about in a few minutes. Some of the presentations of CML are not too different than what we just saw for the CLL patients. They can be fatigue and sweats and weight loss, sort of systemic findings. On physical exam, they don't tend to have the lymph node enlargement like you see with CLL, but you can have a big spleen or a big liver, pretty similar to what we saw with the other disease. And the common findings are unlike the high lymphocyte count in the peripheral blood, this time you tend to see a high neutrophil count. So you tend to have a very high count, but it's a different lineage of white cells compared to what you saw with the CLL population. And about a third or so of the patients are asymptomatic at the time that they're diagnosed, and it's really just a diagnosis that's made, again, concurrently when you're in the process of being evaluated for either another problem or just on a routine physical exam. Now, one of the things that's exciting about CML is that it's one of the very few diseases that we treat in cancer where it's very clear what the molecular or the chromosomal abnormality is that causes this disease. And what it is is it's basically a combination of a piece of a chromosome uh, 9 that joins up with a piece of chromosome 22. Now, under normal circumstances, you have a total of 46 chromosomes. You have um, uh, 23 from the mother and 23 from the father. And uh, under most circumstances, you can actually look at those chromosomes under the microscope and see an orderly array of 23 pairs, so a total of 46 of the chromosomes. When you have diseases like CML, however, sometimes the specific piece of one chromosome can just break off and join up with another piece of a chromosome. So if you actually can do this in the laboratory, you can give a mouse CML just by giving them that same translocation between these two chromosomes and injecting that into the animal. Um, those cancers are a little bit more complicated than that, but that's the beauty of this particular one. It's a specific abnormality that also allows us to target what that abnormality is, and if you can fix that or get around it, then you can potentially cure the disease. And that's what some of the newer treatments have allowed us to do, so that we're now able to put people on drugs that will reverse the abnormality that you see with this uh, 922 translocation, and basically people's blood counts will go back to normal and stay there now for 10, 15, 20 years, as long as they remain on that medicine. Some of the drugs that uh, have uh, been used, the first one is a drug called Gleevec or Imatinib, um, and now the more recent generations or the more recently approved drugs, there's a slew of them, um, and these are the names here. Um, the other reason I just wanted to mention this is that this was really the the first truly targeted therapy that we had so that one drug fixes one problem and in this circumstance that one problem once it's fixed then the disease disappears. So it really made, um, it sort of was the uh, hallmark of this whole new generation of treatments that have allows for what we call personalized medicine and uh, if you can fix a particular problem, then you can make great strides in terms of uh, getting rid of the cancer. And the pharmaceutical industry saw this, realized how critical this was and how effective it could be, and it's really uh, just a major breakthroughs in lots of different diseases, but this was kind of the uh, poster child, if you will, for this kind of targeted treatment uh, 15, 20 years ago. Now, moving on to the acute leukemias, um, and the first one is what we call acute myeloid leukemia. This tends to be the commonest leukemia, acute leukemia rather, in, uh, in adults. Um, and so the classification requires that you have to have at least 20% of this kind of cell in your marrow or circulating in your peripheral blood. What we talk about are hour rods and those these little combinations of uh, granules here that you'll see that sort of look like little rods in the cytoplasm. That's kind of diagnostic for this particular disease. You can either see it in patients de novo, they can present with this, or if they have an underlying disorder in their marrow for several years, not infrequently, this is kind of what the end result is of diseases like what we call myelodysplastic syndrome or the myeloproliferative diseases. 
Um, it's usually seen in adults with a peak incidence like with a chronic leukemia of around 65. And the treatment for this requires very intensive chemotherapy. It might include a bone marrow or stem cell transplant. And it can cure about 40% of patients that um, uh, uh, present with these diseases. Some types of acute myeloid leukemia are treatable or curable 70 to 80 percent of the time. Some other forms are only curable 10 percent of the time, really depending a lot on what the chromosome abnormalities are that actually are the DNA signals for why this uh, particular uh, cancer has developed. And going back to that early slide that I showed you about this hematopoietic tree, it's a malignancy of the committed myeloid progenitor cell so that if this is your stem cell, some of the cells will still go off this way and become normal lymphocytes. But all of these guys that would normally arrive from this myeloid progenitor cell are dysfunctional or absent because the cells kind of get stuck at this level and they never grow through to maturation the way they're supposed to. So people don't have a normal platelet count. They usually don't have a normal white blood cell count. All those numbers tend to be either very high because they're replaced by malignant cells or very low because they're not present because malignant cells aren't growing up the way that they're supposed to. And so those are, those are kind of the hallmarks of the myeloid leukemias. And this is, again, to show you that business about what a normal marrow looks like. You see this is a platelet precursor. Some of these are red cell precursors. Some of these are white cell precursors. But then over here on the right-hand side, everything kind of looks the same. And if you're uh, used to looking at these smears, you would look at that and say, you know, this is a myeloid leukemia, and there are special testing and stains that we could do to tell you that. But the point is that you don't tend to see the diversity that you should see. It's a kind of a monotonous population of cells. Again, this is looking at the issue of the biopsy. The previous one was the aspirate, and that kind of can tell you what individual cells look like. This, again, tells you a little bit more what the total architecture looks like. And under a normal circumstance, again, you're seeing some platelet precursors here and a little bit of diversity, whereas on the left-hand side, pretty much everything looks the same. Uh, and, this, and the cellularity itself tends to be very high because the normal fat has been replaced by these myeloid cancer cells that kind of overwhelm the normal architecture of the marrow itself. Now, the other big acute leukemia is acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And probably the biggest difference between this and the myeloid leukemia is not just the cell of origin. Again, this is where it's the top guy uh, or the lymphocyte cells that tend to be abnormal. Your myeloids aren't so much affected, but the lymphoid progenitor cells are. But the major difference here, as I'll show you in a second, is that not only do these cells also uh, become unable to differentiate, so you don't get the maturation into the normal cells the way you're supposed to, but it tends to present in a different population of patients. Um, ALL is a disease that's most common in children, and the good news about this is that even though it tends to peak in very young people, uh, with the peak incidence sometimes around uh, uh, 4 or 5, the average age of diagnosis is around 11, so you certainly do see it in adults, but it's a much more common illness in children than it is in adults. And myeloid diseases tend to be much more common in adults. Lymph uh, lymphoid leukemias tend to be much more common in kids. The good news with this, though, is that it's curable very frequently, and so with appropriate treatment for this, this is one of the sort of uh, hallmarks, if you will, of pediatric leukemia, is that uh, it's a very bad disease to begin with, but most of the time with intensive treatment, you can cure these children, and so 80 to 90 percent of them will end up being cured of their leukemia at the end of their therapy. Now, what do these diseases look like? And this is a uh, a little bit generic, and it's not any more specific for the lymphoid diseases than it is for the myeloid leukemias, but the point is that people can present with anemia. Their red blood cell count is low because you've got all these abnormal lymphoid cells, and you don't have enough in there making normal platelets and normal red cells. The white count, the neutrophils, tend to be low, so people tend to get infections with this. When their platelet count is low, or what we call thrombocytopenia, that's when folks get bleeding. And then these same cells will actually infiltrate the liver and the spleen, so you end up with a big liver, big spleen, and sometimes people can lose weight. What this picture is just showing you is a chest x-ray, and the issue here is that if the white count gets high enough, you actually start to see infiltrates because the white cells start to replace the normal um, 
uh, space in the uh, lung itself, and it will show up and it can look like an infection or just looks like it's sort of an inability to get enough oxygen in because now the white cell number is so high that it's actually clogging up the lungs a little bit. And another way to look at this is that in the ALL population, you can see these uh, swollen lymph nodes, and this in this case is in the mediastinum or the middle of the chest. Uh, you can also see ex what we call extranodal presentations, so it's not uncommon for lymphocytic leukemia to show up in the central nervous system, the brain, and the spinal cord. So it's very common for kids to get spinal taps and they get treatments into their spinal cord in order to keep them from developing disease there or treating it, even if it does show up. And then testicular involvement is another site that's pretty common in ALL patients, tends to be uncommon in myeloid leukemia, but pretty common in testicular. Testicular involvement is pretty common in children with ALL. And I said, again, as I said here, in uh, children, the cure rates can be as high as 90%, not quite as good in adults, somewhere in the range of 20 to 50%, again, depending on the extent of disease of presentation. And transplantation tends to be a very active part of the treatment in most adults with lymphoblastic leukemia, less so in children because they're usually cured with uh, more conventional therapies that don't require transplant. All right, now the next big category I'm going to talk about is what we call lymphomas. And lymphomas are split up into two big categories, what we call the non-Hodgkin's lymphomas and the Hodgkin lymphomas. And the importance of this slide is that most of the uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, about 85% are what we call in the B-cell lineage, whereas only about 15% are in the T-cell group. And so lymphocytes normally are either B-cell or T-cell, and I won't go into too much how we came up with those uh, nomenclatures, but it has to do with where in the body the cells tend to be processed and kind of where they come from. Uh, but most of the lymphomas come out of the B-cell lineage. And then what we call the working formulation is basically a way to uh, help us separate out the different kinds of lymphomas and give you an idea of uh, what the natural history of the disease is going to be. And long story short is that uh, there are three major categories. There's what we call a low-grade uh, lymphoma, an intermediate-grade lymphoma, and then a high-grade lymphoma. These are diseases that are a little bit like the chronic lymphocytic leukemias. They're very difficult to cure, but they can be well-treated and people live with for a very long period of time. The intermediate grade lymphomas tend to be pretty curable, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a minute in terms of the chemotherapy that's required here. And the high grade lymphomas are also curable, but this is a sicker population of patients who present with much uh, more problems related to fever, sweats, weight loss, uh, and in many ways this disease uh, in the high grade setting uh, can be almost more like an acute leukemia that requires very intensive treatment very early in order to cure patients. Hodgkin lymphoma is the other general category of lymphoma, and I'll show you more about the two in a minute, uh, but this tends to be less common than the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, it tends to be a little bit more common in younger people, uh, and so this is a common disease that you'll see in people in their 20s and 30s, whereas the non-Hodgkin's lymphomas tend to be more in an older population of patients. Now, the epidemiology of lymphomas are that, um, as I said, they're cancers of the lymphocytes. Uh, usually, instead of showing up in the bloodstream, though, they show up in the lymph nodes. So people will end up with a swollen lymph node in their neck or under their arm or maybe in their groin or maybe a lymph node in their chest that you can't see but can actually compress on the airways so people can have trouble with their breathing and so on. There's about 74,000 new lymphoma cases each year in the U.S., and about 90% or 85% away are in the non-Hodgkin's group, and about 10,000 new cases a year are of Hodgkin's lymphoma, with a peak incidence in teen years, and then there's again a slight peak when people get out over the age of 50. Um, about 21,000 deaths a year in the U.S. due to lymphoma, and about 1,000 people every day are diagnosed worldwide, so it is a disease that tends to be global, uh, and you see it in uh, throughout the world, as I'll show you again in a second. Uh, this gives you some idea of what the distribution of this disease is. And, um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, so basically what you're seeing here is that the uh, red areas tend to be more common. And so this is where you tend to see a little bit more of these lymphomas. Other parts of the world, like Central Africa or Asia, you see a little bit less. 
but Australia, the US, and in Europe tends to be a higher incidence of the non Hodgkin's lymphomas. You tend to see it more commonly with advancing age. It's oftentimes associated with infections because the immune system's not working very well. Uh, and finally, you can see lots of new therapies for this disease. Um, or lots of new therapies are leading to an increased uh, risk of this disease. And that's because a lot of the new treatments that we're using for what we call immune-mediated diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or things like that, the treatments for those diseases are very powerful immune-controlling uh, uh, compounds, which if you listen carefully to all the advertising on TV, they actually can lead to a higher rate of lymphoma. That's not a reason not to take those treatments, but as we uh, perturb the immune system with these very powerful medicines, unfortunately a small percentage of cases will come back to haunt us because it can lead to uh, a lymphoma down the road. So it's just the kind of thing that uh, I'm sure your physicians are very aware about and uh, people that are on some of these new powerful immune treatments for some of these diseases like arthritis down the road, unfortunately, going to be a little bit more at risk for uh, this kind of a uh, cancer because of the treatments that they're receiving. Now, Hodgkin lymphoma um, is a uh, slightly different uh, um, a disease. Uh, the classic uh, uh, for this disease is what we call, or the classic hallmark under the microscope was what we call a Reed-Sternberg cell. It's an activated B cell. Um, the peak incidence in Hodgkin's lymphoma is in their 20s with a little bit of a peak out beyond age 50. Um, most of the time, Hodgkin's lymphoma is just limited to the lymph nodes. And so it tends to start with a single lymph node, maybe in the neck, and then the next site that would be involved might be a lymph node above the collarbone or under the arm or in the chest. And so it tends to show up kind of in stages like that. It doesn't usually show up in the bone marrow or in the lung or in the uh, liver or the other organs. Um, and so in that way, it's much more limited for the majority of times to the lymph node system. non Hodgkin's lymphoma tends to be a little bit more what we call systemic, and so people can end up with involvement of the lymph nodes or the lymphocytes in their bone marrow uh, or in other organs. Uh, and so it tends to be what we call a more advanced stage because it's involving extranodal disease sites. But Hodgkin's tends to be limited to the lymph nodes, except in about 20% of the cases where it will show up in extranodal sites like the bone marrow or in the lung at presentation. This is what the Reed-Sternberg cell looks like, and it's kind of a classic picture under the microscope. We talk about it looking a little bit like allies. Uh, and so you see these two nuclei in one cell, uh, and this is what your pathologist would be looking for to make the diagnosis of Hodgkin lymphoma uh, in the background that you see here of other cells uh, that don't quite have the same classic characteristic as this um, uh, ally uh, cell here does. <clears throat> now, whether it's Hodgkin or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that we're talking about, we tend to use the same staging uh, classification, and that is that stage one disease is a single lymph node that's um, uh, or a single extranodal site. So occasionally people will present with just a mass in the lung that would be adjacent to the lymph nodes in their chest, and that might be considered a stage 1E for extranodal. But more commonly, it's going to be in the lymph nodes, and then it may extend to the adjacent area, so that would then be um, uh, 2E or so. If you have two or more nodal regions uh, or an extranodal site and a regional lymph node on the same side of the diaphragm, that would be stage two lymphoma. If you have lymph nodes on both sides of the diaphragm, that's stage three. And if you have lymph nodes that are, um, uh, or if you have involvement outside the lymph nodes, like the liver, the bone marrow, that would be stage four. In each category, we also include what we call an A or a B. And A or B, what we call symptoms, are that A denotes the absence of fevers, sweats, or a 10% weight loss. And B is the category that you assign to the stage if they do have fever, sweats, or more than a 10% waist loss. And in every case, the patients who have 1B tend to do worse than 1A and so on. That's because B usually means that it's more an aggressive, a more aggressive biology and is associated with these other kind of uh, what we call systemic symptoms. Now, the working formulation, just to summarize here, uh, I talked to you a little bit about the low grade, the intermediate grade, and the high grade here. And then Hodgkin's is a little bit different on the bottom, but if you look at the non-Hodgkin's here, 
This is the way these diseases tend to present. Oftentimes, the low grade will present as asymptomatic patients who may have a swollen lymph node, or occasionally they'll have abnormalities on their blood smear. And then you really just treat the symptoms, because most of our treatments will not cure these patients, so you just want to make sure that if they're having symptoms, you get those under control, but you don't want to over-treat them and make their treatment worse than their disease. The intermediate grades, what we call the diffuse large cell lymphomas, Frequently, they are more symptomatic, but the good news there is that with combinations of chemotherapy and radiation, these are frequently curable. And then the high-grade diseases, likewise, these are usually patients that are sick, but with aggressive treatments, you can oftentimes cure these people as well. Hodgkin's disease is treated with a combination of drugs called ABVD, with or without radiation. And the good news is that Hodgkin's lymphoma is probably curable 70 to 80% of the time. And so if you have to have a lymphoma, this is probably the one to have. And so in general, all of these tend to be treatable and are frequently curable as long as you're treated appropriately with chemotherapy or radiation. And so the last group of diseases I'm going to talk about for a few minutes are what we call the plasma cell dyscrasias. And this is a fancy term, but the commonest disease here that you probably recognize is what we call multiple myeloma. And when I was in training, multiple myeloma was a really bad disease because it tended to show up late, and our treatments were not very good for it, and the average survival was usually in the range of two to three years. Now, with the treatments that we currently have available, including new drugs and transplantation, the average survival is closer to 10 to 12 years. So people have done much better over the last 20 to 30 years uh, with this disease, and it's still not easy to cure. In fact, rarely is it cured, but you can control it for a much longer period of time than we uh, did uh, 20 to 30 years ago. Now, there's a bunch of other names for myeloma or for variants of myeloma that are listed here, smoldering myeloma, AMGOS, or monoclonal gammopathy, and these are probably, for the most part, precursors of myeloma, and if you follow these people over time, many of them will develop myeloma, but you can watch them initially if they're asymptomatic and you just pick this up on a laboratory test. And then there are other diseases like amyloidosis or Waldenstrom's that are kind of subsets of this whole abnormality of these plasma cells, which tend to produce abnormal proteins um, and cause some other problems that I'll talk about in a second. Now, remember I talked to you about how monotony is not good? Well, this is what a bone marrow looks like in somebody with uh, multiple myeloma. And you see all of these guys all are the same, basically, or at least 90% of these cells are what we call plasma cells. And the hallmark of a plasma cell, this is a great example, you see the nuclear material here, the nucleus of the cell, and now adjacent to it you have this little area that's a little bit clear, and this is actually the part of the cell that's secreting abnormal protein, and it's the protein that shows up in the bloodstream that you frequently will pick up on your laboratory test, and you can monitor that abnormal protein in the, blood, uh, in the peripheral blood, uh, serum as a marker for how well you're doing at treating somebody with myeloma. So it gives you a pretty good handle on uh, how well or poorly somebody's doing just by monitoring their blood counts. Um, the epidemiology, it's about 1% of all cancers. It's about 10% of all blood cancers. There's about 20,000 new cases a year. And as I said before, the average lifespan now is about 10 years, whereas 10 years ago or 20 years ago it was probably only two to three years. The findings associated with the abnormal uh, proliferation of cells in the marrow are that you can get anemic, you can have a low white blood cell count because now you've got all these plasma cells that are in there and kind of squeezing out the normal cells. These plasma cells unfortunately make an abnormal protein and so keep people from developing their normal immunoglobulins, which are part of how the body defends itself against strep infections and against um, viruses and things like that. So you get too much of a bad protein and not enough of the good guys uh, running around under normal circumstances. This kind of protein or this kind of disease can also damage the bones, and I'll show you more about that in a second. As it damages the bones, the bones also release calcium, so people can end up with high calcium levels, and that can cause many of its own problems in terms of symptoms that people have. And finally, uh, people will oftentimes present with either pain or with compression on the uh, nerves in, that may go down their leg or in their arm because now you've got this collection of plasma cells in the marrow that are pushing the marrow in the vertebral bodies and so on uh, on top of a nerve. The nerve gets squished and it hurts or it may not work very well and those are the kind of problems that you can get, can, can get into with this disease. Now I mentioned the bone disease. Well, 
this is actually what the skull x-ray would look like in somebody with myeloma. And you see here, this basically is a big area that's been kind of carved out of the skull. Uh, and yes, quite frankly, that's like a hole in the brain, or, or not in the brain, but in the skull, in the uh, cortex of the bone surrounding the brain. And if you look here, there's this obvious large one here, and then there are several others that are scattered about. And so this is the kind of picture that you can see with myeloma. It damages the bone, and it can uh, cause weakening of the bone. You could also imagine that if a lesion like this showed up in your leg, you'd be at risk for a broken leg. So it's not uncommon for people to present with a fractured leg or a fractured arm as a result of multiple myeloma uh, because it's weakened the cortex of the bone itself, so none of the bone has no strength and will actually fracture very easily. Now, the presenting symptom in 70% or so of the patients uh, is bone pain. So it's common for people to present with back pain that they've had for a while. It may not get picked up on regular x-rays. And if you don't do the right test, you could be treating somebody for back pain for several months before you think, well, gee, this isn't going away with just regular uh, treatments for pain medicine. Uh, let me look and see if there isn't something else going on. And so we talked a little bit about what we call pathologic fractures, like I alluded to before, in the leg or in the arm. Uh, neurologic pain, if these uh, combinations of pressure on the, on the bone itself will push onto a nerve root that can cause pain in the leg or pain down the arm. Uh, and then commonly involved bones that you pick up under x-rays might be in the vertebral column or the ribs or the skull. And all of those areas, just like I showed you in the skull, can end up with these little holes in them as a result of the way these cells damage the marrow itself or damage the bones. And so the last slide I think I'm going to show here on myeloma is what we call an M spike. And M stands for monoclonal. And so many of you are, um, are going to be seeing this, might well pursue careers in the laboratory as uh, laboratory technologists, or maybe go on to a career that in some way involves research in the lab. And so if you do what we call a serum protein electrophoresis, and down here this is the person who's the patient on this column here, and this would be a normal. The point is that if you look under the normal uh, smear, you take a little piece of the serum and you put it on a gel and you run a current over it, the proteins will migrate along that and give you this kind of a spectrum of lots of different kinds of bands which represent different collections of proteins. If you do that in somebody with myeloma, you'll still see some of this normal albumin here, and you'll still see some of the other normal proteins, but now you've got this funny band sitting down here. Well, that's because this band is the band that's reflective of the cancer cells, and this is that monoclonal protein or that M spike that you're going to be measuring in somebody with uh, myeloma. So you actually can use this and then get this as a way to tell you how much that is, and so if we put this person on treatment and looked again three months later, you would expect this smear to look different, and they would no longer uh, hopefully have this M spike, and this smear would then start to look more like this smear, and that would tell you that you were succeeding in the therapy that you were giving them. Other things that can happen with myeloma are that people, these protein levels can cause problems with the kidneys. They can also cause problems with what we call hyperviscosity, where there's so much protein in the blood that it just doesn't circulate. And people can get confused. They can have problems with hearing loss or headaches, and those are all the kinds of things that folks with advanced myeloma can show up with. All right, so the last three slides I've got here are actual, um, not so much about the individual diseases, but rather uh, what kinds of problems do patients with any of these cancers have uh, that uh, you folks either as patients or more likely as caregivers for somebody in the future uh, may be able to help them out with. Well, as with anybody with cancer, there's always a lot of fear and there's always a lot of anxiety about it. Sometimes it's a fear of death. Sometimes it's a fear of pain. It's amazing. Um, you know, when you're faced with these kinds of diagnoses, one of the things that people always ask is, you know, doc, is this going to hurt? Well, if it's somebody who presents with back pain, that's one thing. But if somebody presents with leukemia, mostly they're just tired, or maybe they're febrile or infected, but they're not usually in a lot of pain. And so it depends a little bit on what kind of symptoms an individual disease presents with, um, but, uh, you know, that are going to be the issues for one particular patient. Uh, but nobody likes to hurt, and folks will ask questions or not ask questions, but this may be on their mind. 
people worry about their loss of dependence, um, of independence rather. I don't want to be a burden to my family. Uh, and so what you can do to make sure that people don't feel like they are um, is uh, can really be pretty critical. And this is really more less to your roles as professionals and more to your roles as caregivers and family members. And then people wonder about the uncertainties about treatment. Um, how do I decide which one to get? How do I decide which physician to go to? Who do I uh, who do I see? Do I see somebody at UNC? Do I see somebody at East Carolina? Do I see somebody in Watauga? Do I see somebody at Duke? Um, and I think you've got to develop a relationship with your primary care physician who tends to be the traffic cop and get you set up for somebody that you're comfortable with. But if you're not comfortable with them or if your family member isn't comfortable, you know, there are other people out there. So don't be hesitant to get a second opinion if you think that will help to allay fears or just to make sure that you're on the right track. And any good physician uh, will not be offended by you asking for another opinion. Uh, that's part of our job is to make sure that um, what we're doing makes sense for you uh, and whatever we can do to make you more comfortable with that decision I think is an important part of our relationship and our contract with you. Uh, people get depressed. They worry about not only all the things that I mentioned up here, but sometimes the problems with these diseases can lead to disfigurement. Uh, if you've lost a lot of weight, that can be somewhat not just debilitating, but also can make you look differently. Uh, you can lose your hair with many of these treatments. That's a problem, particularly for women, but it's a problem for men as well. And then help with self-care, and that gets to the issue of nobody wants to be a burden, particularly if they've lived an active and independent life. Uh, but sometimes they just can't take care of things as much as they'd like to, so being able to help them out becomes pretty important. What are the, some of the specific things that people can show up with? Well, fatigue. Most people will be somewhat anemic, and that means the red blood cell count is low. When the red blood cell count is low, your tissues just aren't getting enough oxygen. That puts an extra stress on your heart. Your heart rate tends to be higher in order to try to pump more blood around, even though the blood itself is not as plentiful as it would be under normal circumstances. And that kind of is a metabolic burden on the patient, and they end up um, kind of losing weight or getting febrile or having other symptoms really just because this process is sort of stealing a lot of the good things that your body should do in order to try to um, feed the cancer, if you will. And so uh, these kinds of symptoms are pretty common. When your blood counts are low, uh, people can end up with infections. As I mentioned before, things that can be staph, strep, stuff like that, and certainly viral infections. People can get a cold that they just can't shake, and that could be because they're not making immunoglobulins or proteins the way they should to fight off these infections. Sometimes people need transfusions, whether they're platelets or red blood cells, and so all of those are things that can make them feel better, but are the kinds of uh, support that folks will need in order to get rid of some of the symptoms they have. And then finally, we talked a little bit about the weight loss here. People can lose appetite, sometimes because they're a little bit depressed. So make sure that uh, if there is a depressive component, that they get support from either their caregiver or from their um, support groups that are available through some of the websites that I'll show you again in a minute. Um, sometimes treatments that they take can make them feel lousy, make them nauseated, make them not feel like eating, take away their appetite, uh, food doesn't taste good, and all of those are things that um, people need to be listened to, uh, and then you just have to work with them on what it is that um, uh, can make them feel better or make their appetite uh, feel a little bit stronger. I would say that uh, one of the common misconceptions is that when people are diagnosed with cancer, um, Sometimes people think, well, what can I do to help beat this? And I would only say to try to eat a healthy and balanced diet, take a multivitamin every day. But what you don't really want to do is go on to any kind of a weight loss program or anything that's going to lead to a reduction in your total calories. Because in general, that is not a good thing to do. It may be a good thing to prevent cancer, but it's not a good thing to do while your body is already uh, sort of starved for nutrition and needs the extra calories during its time that it's trying to fight whatever the cancer is, particularly if it's somebody who's under intensive chemotherapy at the time. Uh, they need their calories, so don't, uh, uh, don't try to get them to do any kind of fancy diet that, uh, that doesn't taste good and doesn't lead to their increase in their caloric intake. And so finally, the issues have to do with things like costs, loss of income, continued living expenses. Um, cancer is not cheap. Healthcare is not cheap. Um, there are resources out there to try to help people come to grips with what we call financial toxicity. 
but unfortunately our system doesn't provide for a lot of the support uh, for child care, transportation, medications, things like that. And so it really becomes very much of a uh, team effort to try to provide as much of the support as you can to offset some of these costs. Emotional support, we talked a little bit about fear of death and disabilities, pain, and then finally just the isolation of, you know, cancer is not contagious, and so it's certainly important that people don't feel like they need to be left alone. Some people want some alone time, that's fine, but for the most part when people are not well, just having somebody else in the house or having somebody sit with them while they're watching television can give them a sense of comfort that they might not otherwise have. And finally, housing, when care is away from home, is a big deal. Uh, we're fortunate here. We have some great facilities in the Ronald McDonald House for children and what we call the SACU Family House for Adults. A lot of facilities do have caring houses or facilities like that to put people up while they're away from home for extended periods of time while they're getting their treatment. And this is just some of the uh, resources available. Uh, this is a website here at UNC that we have, and I can leave this up that people can plug into. Uh, there's a lot of information available online, and then there's also information available from a number of the support groups, like the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, the Multiple Myeloma Research Fund, and the American Cancer Society all have patient-specific uh, websites that people can find resources there that are available. Sometimes it's financial, sometimes it's just advice, sometimes it's access to chat rooms or things like that. but Whatever makes the process a little bit easier for people and their families is important, and these are some of the resources that are available to the public. So with that, I'll go ahead and conclude, um, uh, and uh, be happy to take questions. I can stick around for a little bit beyond 2 o'clock if people have things that uh, take us a little bit longer. Thanks. All right. Dr. Shea, thank you so much. Uh, the, the slide, the previous slide there with the uh, link, uh, that is available on our website. If you go to unccn.org to events, you'll find it there under past events. You'll find this presentation, and you can download all of the slides that were present today. Um, let's go ahead and open this up for questions. So just a reminder, if you didn't do this already, you can go ahead and text to the number 22333, the letters UNCCN, and uh, you'll get a join message back, and then you can just go ahead and start texting in questions. Uh, Dr. Shea, for those living a number of years with CLL, do they die of the disease or other causes? Well, it's a great question, and it really depends on uh, how old they are when they're diagnosed with CLL and also what other kind of problems they have. But it's not uncommon for somebody to not die of their chronic leukemia, but rather to have a heart attack if they're 75 or 80. Um, and so it's, uh, that's also part of why it's important to kind of keep people going and try to live as much of a normal life as they can, because oftentimes other problems, diabetes, uh, cardiac disease, things like that, be, can become a bigger issue for them than their actual CLL is. All right, thank you. For a patient with smoldering or indolent multiple myeloma, what are the treatment options for them to slow or help prevent progression of symptomatic and we'll have to infer from there? Yeah. Uh, so that's also a very good question. And, um, you know, what this means is, that, as I said, um, there are people who have uh, in early forms of myeloma where it's asymptomatic. People don't have any bone pain. They have normal kidney function. They're not anemic. Um, and then there's another group that's really what we call a, a MGOS, or it's not even quite myeloma yet, but about 20% uh, of people will eventually develop myeloma. I think in general, the rule of thumb is that unless you have um, a very high burden of myeloma in the bone marrow or a very high protein level, Otherwise, unless you have some symptom, most of us are not treating myeloma these days. And so treating somebody who's asymptomatic and doesn't have a particularly high burden of disease, in general, we would say that treatment is not uh, appropriate to start until they develop some evidence of organ dysfunction because the treatments themselves can lead to an increased risk of infection. Some of the treatments lead to a higher rate of what we call myelodysplasia. And so all of those have side effects from which um, which could oftentimes be as bad as a disease. So absent symptoms or organ damage, we don't usually treat people with myeloma. All right, thank you. Uh, really impressed with all the questions coming in. Uh, in pediatric ALL, is there correlation between the number of relapses to mortality? Um, yeah, and I think that's not specific to pediatric ALL. I think in just about every one of these diseases, uh, if you have a curable disease like 
ALL or AML or even some of the non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, your best shot at cure is going to be associated with your initial treatment. Um, it doesn't mean that it's not going to be incurable if it comes back after the initial treatment, and that's where things like transplant can become appropriate, or particularly in the case of pediatric ALL now with the uh, CAR T cells, the chimeric antigen receptor T cells that are available specifically for pediatric ALL patients, there are clearly people that are being cured um, who would have died 10 years ago, um, and they're being cured with some of these new therapies. But I think in general, it's safe to say that unfortunately, with every relapse, your chance of achieving cure in a home run tends to be a little bit lower than the previous time. But uh, particularly with kids, um, it's hard to say when, when to stop because there is always something else down the road and there are new treatments that are becoming available all the time. All right. Thank you. Uh, why would an MD choose second or third generation ABEL TKIs over Gleevec? Okay, so that's a pretty sophisticated question, um, okay. and so, but um, the uh, the question is, um, Gleevec was the first of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors for somebody with CML, as is shown on the previous or one of the earlier slides. There's now four or five others that are available. These other treatments have been shown to have a more rapid onset of response than Gleevec has. And in several of the cases, there is a higher rate of what we call complete remission so that you can no longer find evidence of the ABLE or the tyrosine, abnormal tyrosine kinase in the bloodstream. And that's kind of your marker looking for that abnormal chromosome. Uh, however, there haven't been any data that has been published that suggests that going to these other drugs will actually increase the percentage of people who are still alive at five or 10 years. And so many of us are still continuing to use Gleevec as the initial treatment of choice, although there are certainly guidelines that would suggest that some of the second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitors are more effective and should be considered the uh, initial treatment of choice. But I think that the bottom line is that survival tends to be about the same, partly because even if you progress on Gleevec, oftentimes these newer drugs um, could then still be effective or something like transplant could be effective. So I think that it's a, it's a conversation with your physician. Um, some of it has to do with cost, things like that, but those are all uh, sort of important details, but uh, probably ones that you can ask 10 oncologists to get at least two or three different answers on. So. All right, time for two more? Sure. All right, uh, what is the new direction in AML treatment? Probably the biggest advance in AML is maybe twofold. One is, uh, there's, there's been a new drug that has been approved over the last year um, for predominantly older patients who have developed acute leukemia uh, in the context of having previous myelodysplastic syndrome or other problems where the marrow we know had been sick for a while and then they developed their acute leukemia. Traditionally, that's been a population that's been very difficult to treat. Um, now, with this newer drug called, I think it's CPX315, um, it's, it might be 351, and so uh, I get those mixed up some. The point is that it's, uh, it is able to achieve a higher remission rate than what our standard treatments have been with what appear to be less toxicity. So that's been an exciting new treatment in AML, predominantly for older patients for whom regular treatments have oftentimes been too toxic. The other big advance in AML has been the ability in the transplant field to use um, donors not just from within the family, but from outside the family and to use partially matched donors. And if you add together now all the potential options we have for finding a donor for somebody, the odds of being able to have a successful transplant are much higher than they were 10 years ago, mostly because the donor pool is much larger than it was before. So if you're not cured with your initial treatment, uh, or even if you have an initial remission but have high-risk disease, then the opportunity for transplant is much greater than it was 10 or 15 years ago. All right. Thank you. And final question, how effective is bone marrow transplant in treating these types of cancers? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the simple answer to that is that it's not simple. And by mm -hmm. that I mean that each of these diseases are a little bit different. Um, and the transplants that we use are also different. In some settings, like for multiple myeloma patients, 
The great majority of people that we treat, we treat with autologous transplants. We actually try to get them into remission and then collect their own blood cells and put those back in after giving uh, the patient high doses of chemotherapy. And while that approach hasn't cured very many patients with myeloma, it leads to an improvement in survival by about three or four years compared to people who don't get transplanted. At least that's what some of the earlier data had shown. Um, when you look at donor transplants for diseases like leukemia or some of the even more advanced lymphomas, the challenge there has to do with how bad is the disease and if the disease has already shown itself to not be very responsive to regular treatments, then oftentimes it's not very responsive even to transplant. And so you can still go through a successful transplant, get donor cells in and everything could work, but it may well be that the disease is still going to come back. And so it just depends a lot on the diseases. It depends on the availability of the donor. And then it depends a lot on the health of the host because what you might be able to do for a 60-year-old person is not quite the same as what you could do for a 20-year-old person just in terms of the intensity of their treatment and um, uh, how likely they would be to tolerate the kind of side effects that any transplant would present. So I think it's a, it's a complicated question. We clearly are curing more people than we used to with transplant, uh, but every case has got to be taken on its own merits before you can decide if it's the right thing to do. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you to our audience for asking some great questions. Uh, let's see, do a couple of quick things before you leave. Uh, you can go to unccn.org forward slash evaluation and please provide us with a, 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 a few minutes of your time to fill out a quick survey. We really count on every one of our audience members to give us feedback so that we can continue to improve our series. So unccn.org forward slash evaluation, click on lecture evaluation survey. Uh, please let us know your thoughts on today's lecture. Uh, we want to thank uh, with the, the uh, generous support from the North Carolina General Assembly for UCRF, that's the University Cancer Research Fund. We want to thank UNC Lineberger. We want to thank the North Carolina Community College System all for their participation. Uh, specifically, we want to call out Renee Batts and Katherine Davis from the Community College System. Here at the UNC Cancer Network, we want to thank our team, uh, Dr. Tom Shea, uh, as well as Mary King, Veneranda Obore, John Powell, and Jean Sellers for all the hard work that they all do to make this series possible. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and close. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we'll be taking a few months off here, and then uh, we hope to come back in the fall with more great lectures for our community college participants. Please stay tuned for information about new lectures. Uh, we'll be getting the information out uh, likely over the summer on those. If you have any questions, find us at unccn.org. Thank you. Have a great afternoon.